Dedicated to Bill's sister. Okay. I think we'll go ahead and do the turnaround. That work? All right, get around, greet somebody, give them a hug. Uh, 305. is going to come for special music, I believe. Thank you, Nancy. 
Yeah, no, I think we're good. Thank you, lady. And Bill. The song I'm going to sing today is from Revelation chapter 5. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll? And they sang a song, a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. shadows deepen but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through do you wish that you
can't see. See, I cut my mic off. Am I on here? You can hear me? Okay. <laughs> I'm good? All right. Thank you, Nancy. That was beautiful. I love that song. Is he worthy? Yes, he is. Amen. All right, if you guys would go to Matthew chapter 21, that's where I'm headed this morning. Uh, when Kurt, you guys know it's Palm Sunday today? At first I thought it was Easter Sunday this morning. Uh, a couple of us were confused, but no, I knew it was Palm Sunday. When Kurt asked me to do this, he, he actually asked me to preach Palm Sunday. That's the first time he's asked me to preach and actually gave me what he wanted me to preach on. So that makes it a little more challenging for a guy who doesn't preach but once or twice a year, but I'm going to give it my best shot here. So this is the triumphal entry, we call it. You guys know that. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. I'm going to read 11 verses here. Uh, my Bible says Jesus enters king as... Uh, G- no, what does it say here? I should know this here. Jesus enters Jerusalem as king. Okay. Matthew chapter 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread those on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Uh, I'll pray real fast. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your church and the fellowship we enjoy as believers, Lord and Holy Spirit. We just ask that you would do the work in our hearts and our lives that only you can do as we seek to glorify you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. June 1838, at the age of 19, Queen Victoria was coronated as the Queen of England. Okay, now this was a spare, no expense event. It was a procession through the city of London. There was 400,000 visitors that came, uh, singers and orchestra, and they presented her a queen's crown that had over 3,000 jewels in it, giant rubies, sapphires, and a 309-carat diamond right in the middle. Ladies, look down at your uh, ring finger real quick. Imagine 309 carats. That's insane, isn't it? But that's what we do for royalty, and, and Jesus... King Jesus never had an earthly coronation like that, and yet there's never been a more worthy king. Amen? Amen. And so if he did have a coronation, this was it. And so I just want to highlight a few things. Um, If you're like me, I I think I've been in church Palm Sunday every Sunday of my life, or just about. So that's what, at least 35 or almost 40 Palm Sunday sermons I've heard. Do you think I could remember one single one as I started to prepare for this? I could not. So I'm just going to go over what struck me. I mean, what struck me as I read this story, and there's a few important key highlights that I want to cover. The first one is that this is, this is in all four Gospels, okay? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all include this, and it's one of the few accounts that, or it's one of the few things in Christ's life that's in all four Gospels. So it's an important event, and there's a lot more that I could unpack here. I just want to encourage you guys to, to go home and put those four together and study it for yourself. But um, we're just going to start here at the triumphal entry, and then I'm going to go another direction with this. Uh, secondly, this is the beginning of Jesus' final journey. This is the end of the road. As he enters Jerusalem uh, on Palm Sunday, he'll be hanging on a cross by Friday. You guys know this. Um, he knows this, but I don't think the disciples knew it. In fact, Kurt Uh, Last week in his sermon, he mentioned that um, Jesus had foretold his death to the disciples, and they didn't get it. Uh, it, They just misunderstood. They missed the point. Um, (laughs) Reminds me of the old husband and the wife. Uh, She's kind of a nosy neighbor, so she's always watching out the front window looking at the neighbors. And so one day she tells her husband, every morning when he goes to work, he gives her a hug and a kiss. And the first thing he does when he gets back is he gives her a hug and a kiss. She says, why can't you do that? And he says, well... Honey, I can't do that. I hardly know her. (laughs) He missed the point, didn't he? (laughs) 
easy for us guys to do sometimes. Uh, the triumphal entry also, it, it, verse 5 quotes it here, it was prophesied about in Zechariah 9, uh, chapter 9, verse 9, and it's quoted here in verse 5. <clears throat> so long before this ever happens, Scripture writes about it and tells about it, and this is one of the great proofs or evidences that we have that God's Word is real and true and that we can stake our lives on it because hundreds of years before Christ ever came, uh, the Old Testament is full of prophecies that he was going to come, and he did come, and he fulfilled those things that were foretold about him. This event is one of them. Aren't you thankful for God's word? <clears throat> Amen. And this was probably a huge crowd, or as my daughter Callie would say, a jimongous crowd. Uh, verse 8 says, a very large crowd. How large? Nobody really knows. Some, uh, some commentary I read said that it could have been as many as 2 million people in Jerusalem at the time. How could they possibly know that? Well, there's a record in 10 AD, so 10 years after the crucifixion, uh, there's a record of 260,000 Passover lambs being killed during Passover week. Okay, so the pattern, they figure, was one per 10 people. That takes you to about 2.6 million people. That's a ton of people. Some, some uh, scholars say it might have been more of like a quarter of a million people as Jesus enters Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Nobody really knows, but it's a huge crowd. And then the last thing I want to mention is that the Jewish leaders who want to kill him, who already have a, they know they hate him, he's a threat to their entire existence. Uh, they're there waiting for him, but they don't have a plan that we know about to kill him this week. Uh, they're busy, it's Passover week, they got jobs to do. Uh, also, they don't have the authority to kill him, only the Romans can do that, you guys know that. And uh, l lastly, there's, it says he's got a very large crowd following him. With this many people in town, this thing has the potential to explode. Maybe some of them are his followers, and it could backfire on them. So they're there, but they don't have the plan to kill him this week. And so some scholars say that Jesus, by riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, that he effectively forces the issue. That, that he forces the issue of the timeline of his death. And as we know, he rides in on Palm Sunday. And on Friday, he's crucified. He's killed the same day as the Passover lambs. Okay. Now I want to talk about what Jesus knew. What Jesus knew. And this is going to get me kind of to the heart of my message. This is what, what did Jesus know as he rode into the city on Palm Sunday? He knew that the same crowd that was praising him and, and singing Hosanna in the highest would be asking the Romans to kill him by Friday. He knew the crowd was a bunch of hypocrites and that this was hollow worship and that they would soon turn on him. And why did they turn on him? Uh, in a nutshell, it's because he wasn't the kind of king they wanted. Uh, they wanted a, a conquering hero king that would free them from Roman rule, uh, a, a warrior king riding in on a white horse. Instead, they get a peacemaker that rides in on a donkey's colt. And so he didn't meet their expectations. And, and so by the end of the week, they've turned on him. But he knew this. It was no surprise to him, and he rode into the city anyway. Another thing he knew, he knew his haters were there waiting for him. He knew, I already mentioned this, but the Jewish leaders and the Sanhedrin, they were there waiting for him, and they would kill him, and he knew that, but he rode into the city anyway. And my point in this is that he didn't ride into the city to be worshipped or praised or hailed as the Messiah. Jesus rode into the city on a rescue mission for sinners. He even loved the ones that uh, killed him. Rejected him, hated him. He, Jesus even loves the hypocrites, the liars, the cheaters, the murderers. In fact, Apostle Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 5 that he didn't come to die for the good people. He came to die for the ungodly and the sinner. Let's see, chapter 5, verse 6. Romans, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so I hear Paul saying here, who does that? Verse 6, who does that? People don't do that, but Jesus does that. I mean, yeah, sure, maybe for your kid, maybe for a spouse or someone you love, you might give your life up. Uh, but what about that neighbor that uh, cusses you that you don't like all that much? Or what about that guy that beat up your daughter or whatever it is? My point here is that the love of Christ is on a whole other level and uh, last thing I want to mention about what Jesus knew is that he knew his disciples would abandon him there. As he rode into the Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he knew that all of his closest followers would eventually abandon him there. So if we fast forward to Matthew chapter 26, we find out that Judas 
Jesus knew that Judas had already made the deal to betray him, and he washed his feet anyway. In fact, he knew all the disciples would abandon him. So often we just focus on Peter denying him three times, and, and that's true. But Scripture says that all of them fell away. All of them abandoned him. Jesus tells Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter says, no, I'm not. Jesus says, yeah, you are. And Peter says, Lord, even if I have to die with you, I won't deny you. And then Scripture says all the other disciples said the same thing. And Jesus says, all of you guys are going to fall away tonight. Let's go there. Uh, Matthew, I just want to read two verses out of this real quick. Matthew chapter 26. If you guys would flip over a couple of pages. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 31 and 32. Uh, just two verses. And I'm going to read them out loud here. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Okay, now hold it. To to me, those two verses don't go together. Okay, verse 31, he says, You guys are all going to fall away and abandon me tonight. And then in the very next verse, he says, But after I've risen, I'm going to go ahead of you into Galilee. What are you talking about, Jesus? I think he meant to say, after I have risen, you guys are all fired. You left me hanging. If you even make it to heaven, I'll see you there. I mean, they failed you in your greatest time of need. Isn't it time to dump them and start over? Right? I mean, let's put out some job applications and collect a, you know, a bunch of uh, applications and see if we can get the very best men for the job. But that's not how Jesus deals. He takes them back. He doesn't just take them back. He wants them back. And this is kind of getting to the heart of my message here today. We see God do this all throughout the Old Testament with his chosen people, with the Israelite people. They're unfaithful to him, but he remains faithful to them. He takes them back. Why? Because he wants to reclaim them and restore them. In the Old Testament, you see uh, God speaks to the prophet Hosea in the book of Hosea. And he tells him, I want you to marry a harlot. I want you to marry a woman who's going to cheat on you and be unfaithful to you. And I want you to have children with her. And and when she cheats on you, you're going to take her back. Why? Because it's a picture of God's unfailing love for his people in spite of their unfaithfulness. And yes, Hosea, God God condemns their unfaithfulness. And and yes, there will be judgment. Yes, uh, sin is wrong. God hates sin. We need to turn from our sin confess our sin, repent from our sin, and go the other way. In fact, Paul, Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 2 that God's kindness and his patience are meant to lead to repentance. And, and Peter says something similar. The Lord is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should read repentance. I think it's important that we all know that this morning, but I also think it's important that everybody knows that there's no sin you can confess that will make him love you any less. He loves you, Period. And if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive it and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. With people, you can put on a a perfect image, a perfect facade, and maybe they'll love you half-heartedly. Jesus sees you for exactly what you are, every sin, every secret thing, everything you've ever done, and he loves you anyway. Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that touch your heart? I mean, that's love beyond limits. Makes me want a closer walk with him. That's why I say there's no sin you can commit that will change his love for you because his love isn't based on how good of a person you are or what you've done or what you haven't done. His love for you is based on who he is and his character. Scripture says God is love. So back to the disciples. Okay, they burn Jesus and he takes them back and he wants them back. Now, I'll admit that's not me. You know, I'll give everybody a chance. I won't want to judge a book by its cover. I mean, I'll give you a chance, but... Once you've burned me, I'm going to have a hard time giving you another chance. Fool me once, uh, shame on me, fool me, however that goes. I used to get a kick of George W. Bush had a blooper of that, you know, and he got it wrong, and he's stumbling, and he finally says, if you fool me, you ain't going to fool me again, you know. I used to love seeing that, but, but that's how the world deals. But thank you, Jesus, that's not how you've dealt with me. Thank you for all the second and third chances I've been given and, and meeting me when I was at my own rock bottom. You might be thinking, yeah, right, Henderson, uh, that's great, but I'm not Jesus. And that reminds me of a story Krista's dad tells all the time. Uh, Dave, my father-in-law, Dave, I was blessed with the greatest father-in-law in the world. 
And uh, I had to call him this week to get this story, but he gave it to me because I remember him telling it. He's got a great friend um, named Greg who runs a national youth ministry. And so he's a Christian guy, and he's an evangelist. He's always sharing the Lord with people. But he's got an Uncle Jack who is not a Christian, and he's just a rough old cob. And so they dare a friend. We dare you to go to Uncle Jack's house and witness to him. We dare you to go over there and share the gospel with him. And so the guy does. He goes over. Uncle Jack answers the door with two beer cans, and one in each hand, one full of beer and one full of chew spit. You know? And to, to his surprise, Jack invites him in, and he goes in and he leads him to Christ. So a little while later, Jack is out you know, sharing his, his new faith, his testimony, his story with a stranger he's met at the, at the health club or wherever. And, and this guy keeps interrupting him. And so Jack tells him, let me talk. Quit interrupting me. If you interrupt me again, I'm going to knock you out. Well, sure enough, the guy interrupts him again, and he gets up and he punches the guy out. And the poor guy looks up at him and says, that's not what Jesus would have done. And Jack looks down and says, well, I'm not Jesus. You know? And I can relate to that sometimes. I mean, we all stumble and fall. Amen? <laughs> I can relate to that. But... I don't know how many of you guys would admit it. I'll speak for myself. I've been there. I've been there. I've, I've been there when he'd had to pick me up. A hundred times he's had to pick me up. You guys know my story. I mean, I've, I've shared some of it here, and I'm sorry for those of you that have already heard it, and it's redundant. I'll give you the quick version, but uh, I grew up a pastor's kid. My dad was a pastor in Sacramento, California. Um, I, I, I accepted Christ. Yeah. <laughs> I accepted Christ at a young age, thanks to my parents, uh, but then as a teenager, I started to rebel and, and, and go the other way. So at 15 years old, I was expelled from the public high school in Sacramento, and I never finished high school. My, my parents, um, they, they did everything they could to try to correct my, my course, but it didn't seem to work. So by the time I was 17, I was in a real mess with the drugs, with the alcohol, and uh, they put me in a boys' home in Los Angeles called the L.A. Dream Center. Figure that, the Dream Center. Sounds good. Wasn't all that great. But it was a Christian program. Uh, they're still there today doing a great ministry. And so I was there until I was about 17 and a half. And when I got out, um, my parents were trying to figure out what to do with me until till I turned 18. And they, you know, basically could be rid of me. And uh, my dad says, I'm going to go to, a, to, to Brazil on a missions trip. And, and convinced me to go with him. So I did. And we get down there, and we're working with a missionary there that, that works with uh, street children in the slums in uh, the huge city of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it was a great experience, and after a week of, of serving there, um, he informs me that my trip was a one-way trip, that he was going home without me, and I was staying there with the missionaries until I turned 18. And so uh, I did. I, I stayed in Brazil for three months, then the, then the visa expired, and, and I wasn't quite 18 when my visa expired, so I went back to Sacramento, and I got in trouble again. And this time, since I was over 18, uh, when I got in trouble, I was in big trouble with the law. And uh, I tell you guys all this because I want you to know that during all of that, I just could not escape the unconditional love of Jesus. I knew I didn't deserve it. But I couldn't escape it. There was a member of my dad's church who was a successful attorney in Sacramento. And, and he stepped up to represent me and help me in the case. Another member of my dad's church, Jay Newton, he was a Sacramento County Sheriff. He came to the jail just to visit me. And in every step of the way, I was reminded that no matter how, how bad it was, I was still loved. And, and that, as that happened, that started to change my life. Um, several times my attorney had, had, had gone into court asking for a continuance or a continuation of my case because the district attorney uh, was a guy named Doug. Uh, he did not want to give me any kind of mercy whatsoever. He, he figured I needed to learn my lesson, and he was right. I knew what I deserved. So he was trying to give me the maximum sentence, and so we kept delaying the case hoping that eventually he would come around, and he never did. And so I remember the judge saying to us, Young man, the next time you come in, you need to expect to stay. You're going to be sentenced. And um, he had already said that whatever the district attorney wanted to do, he was going to agree with. Well, I was also out on bail at the time, and my mother, she called and said, the movie The Passion of the Christ came out in the theater. 
I don't even know if I can get through this story telling this. I'm going to do my best. But she took me to that movie. And as I watched that movie of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, I wept through the whole thing. And I finally realized in that theater in Sacramento that no matter how far I had run, no matter what I had done, it didn't change his love for me. And so in that moment, I recommitted my life to Christ in that movie theater. And when we got out, I knew I still had to face the consequences in court. And so uh, that final day of court came, and we go to court, and my mother was with me. My parents at that time, they had already moved from California to Minnesota. My dad took a church in Minnesota, but my mom had come back, and she went to court with me. And we went in expecting the worst, and we got there to find out Doug, the district attorney, had called in sick. And I had a rookie district attorney, a young girl who was compassionate. And so my my lawyer started to plead my case, and he told her, and she says, well, I'm good with it as long as Doug's good with it. Let me call Doug and make sure. And, of course, we knew the answer already. And she called Doug, and he didn't answer the phone. And I walked out of there that day with nothing but probation, and it was just total undeserved mercy. And, uh, like I say, my parents had already moved, so I tried to get my probation transferred to, to Minnesota. I wanted to get out of California in the worst way. I knew I needed a fresh start, and, and all my family was gone. And so I put in for a transfer of my probation to Minnesota, and... Um, they denied me, so I didn't get it. And as Christmas was approaching, um, I started to get real low. I mean, real sad about the fact that I was stuck in California and I was going to spend Christmas without my family. I was living in an apartment with a, a roommate, a friend of mine named Joel, and he was a great Christian guy and he was helping me, but it was, I wanted to be with my family at that time. And so I was just real broken up about the fact that I couldn't be with them. And um, the week of Christmas... I got a surprise call from my probation officer. Those are never good, by the way. (laughs) And uh, he informed me that he had a surprise call from the state of Minnesota. They had changed their mind, and my probation had been transferred, and I could leave California immediately. And so on Christmas Eve day, 2004, I left Sacramento and never went back. I got to Minnesota. I met Krista, and... um, life started to change. I mean, how do I even stand up here and describe the grace and the mercy and the kindness of Jesus? How do you describe the indescribable? Another time in my life I want to tell you about as quick as I can here, because I want you to know why I love Kurt McNabb so much. We had a great pastor, don't we? So this is probably five or six years, probably six years ago now. We were living in Virginia. We had kids at the time. And uh, I had drifted from the Lord again. I wasn't in the same kind of mess I was in before, but, but I was going the wrong direction, and I knew it. We weren't going to church faithfully. I was making some bad choices, and um, I got in trouble one night for spotlighting a deer. I love deer hunting, but I learned my lesson. So I, they actually arrested me for that. They arrested me for spotlighting a deer, and they took me to the jail, and they booked me, and they gave me a court date, and they let me go. But Krista and the kids had to come pick me up at the jail. And I just remember when I got home, I felt like such a, such a failure as a, as a dad, uh, as a husband. I was just really in the mental dumps. And so I had gone into the garage just so I could be by myself because I was crying. And, and I, was, I, I had opened my Bible. I was reading my Bible. And I started praying, Lord, I, want, I, need, I need you to change my life. I want my life to be different than it is right now. And uh, as I was praying that prayer, my phone rang. And it was Kurt McNabb. And I hadn't talked to Kurt in at least three years. And some of you guys know my history with Kurt before that. He should have deleted my phone number a long time ago. But uh, as you guys know, our pastor is one of the most gracious, loving, and forgiving men you'll ever meet. And so I answered the phone. I said, Kurt, what a surprise. You know, I'm trying to, you know, sound like I'm not sitting there crying. And he says, uh, It's like God tapped me on the shoulder and said, call Justin. And of course, I started crying. (laughs) There's no way he could have known. And he says, would you come to Wyoming and see what what I'm doing? I think you're meant to be a part of this. And I said, Kurt, I can. I've just been arrested for spotlighting a deer. And he got quiet for a second. He said, even better. When can you come? (laughs) That's Kurt McNabb. 
And the rest of that story is history. Here we are. But I love Kurt for many reasons, but, but most of all because God used him in my life at a time when I needed that grace and that compassion and that love and that mercy the most. And I've told Kurt this before. I've said, you know, when you're wandering around out in the wilderness in the dark with no flashlight, and somebody shows up with a flashlight and says, follow me, you never forget it. So Jesus, he'll let you leave the past in the past. Amen? People love to dig up the past. People, I got family members and friends. Every time I talk to them, something from the past is going to come up. And I don't, there's a lot I could say about that. I don't want to offend anybody, so I'll just leave it at this. Why do you think there's so many female archaeologists? <laughs> I'm sorry, ladies. Terrible joke. <laughs> but if I, could, if I could get rid of those if I could get rid of those memories, if I could give them away and never have to think about them again, I don't think I would do it. I wouldn't do it. And it's not because I'm proud of it. I don't like to talk about it. But it's a constant reminder of God's grace at work in my life. And I'm not the man I want to be. I'm not the man I should be all the time. But thank you, Lord, I'm not the man that I used to be. So Jesus here, he says to his own disciples, yeah, I know you're going to abandon me, and they're going to kill me, and then I'm going to rise from the grave, and when it's all done, I'm going to meet you in Galilee because I still love you, and I still have a plan for your life. So what's the big deal about Galilee? I'm going to bring this to a close. I better hurry and get to Clark. Well, I got, I'm good. Uh, what's the big deal about Galilee? Okay, so Ga you guys might know this. At that, in that time... Uh, the Israelite people, the, the, the Israel was divided into three regions. In the south, you had Judea. That's where Jerusalem is. That's where the triumphal entry is happening. Right above that, you had Samaria, Judea, Samaria. And above that, you had Galilee. Galilee's all the way in the north. Okay, in the south, Judea, Jerusalem, that's the upper crust. That's the elite. Those people, uh, you know, they're in the south... They're, they're the, the high class. And then, of course, the people in the north in Galilee, there's a lot of trade routes there. There's a lot of travelers passing through. Um, the people in the south view these people as unclean people. Okay, this is kind of a rejected area as far as the Israel goes. And so, um, but for Jesus and for the disciples, Galilee was home. Galilee is where they first met Jesus and where he called them each to follow him. It's where they witnessed a lot of the early miracles and they first witnessed his power. It's where they, in essence, it's where they discovered their first love for him, their childlike faith for him. This was home. And so here Jesus is telling them, yeah, you're going to fail me. But when this is all over, I'm going to meet you at home. Let's go home. And we can start again. Sometimes in life, we got to go back to the beginning to start again. I don't know if any of you guys have had that experience, but I sure have. Sometimes you got to go forward, you got to go backwards before you can go forwards. And so as I, uh, as I close this here this morning, uh, I just want to say that maybe some of you guys are like me when I was 18 or 19. Uh, you've drifted from the Lord, or maybe um, you just need to know the day that He loves you and He wants you back. And if uh, you got anybody you're struggling to forgive or accept back, maybe it's a prodigal son or daughter that used to be me, I just want to encourage you guys to uh, take them back. Love them anyway. Love them in every chance you get because it might just be the very thing that turns their heart to him. And then I know most of you guys here have been following him a long time. But if that passion of that first love, that childlike faith has faded he wants you back to and what better week than this week passion week to make that commitment amen uh, one of my favorite pastors that i listen to a lot he's a friend of my dad's jim simbley he says uh, the perseverance of the saints is made up of a thousand new beginnings and i think the uh, christian life you could say is made up of a thousand new beginnings thank you lord Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, your goodness, your kindness, your mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to go to that cross for me, for everyone in this room. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you this morning. You are worthy. 
And Holy Spirit, we just ask you to be with us as we go this week, that we would honor you and love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and share the love of Christ with the world around us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.